All right, so we're going to pick up with the central nervous system today, which is made up of the brain and spinal cord. So we talked about action potentials, graded potentials, how we stimulate a neuron to bring information from the outside and carry that information onward through neurons. So now we're going to talk about the central nervous system that receives that input and then carries it along for processing. So to do that, we want to just review the anatomy of the spinal cord. And we, this is kind of good timing because we talked about this in lab already. So what is the yellow structure here? Out here, not yet. It doesn't divide yet. Out here, it's one complete structure. We just call it a spinal nerve. And how many do we have? How many pairs? 31 pairs. OK, so we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And what is a nerve? A nerve is a bundle of myelinated axons. A bundle of myelinated axons outside the central nervous system. Because the central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord. And this is not within the brain and spinal cord. It's extending off of the spinal cord or the brain in the case of the cranial nerves. So that's a definition of a nerve. Bundle of myelinated axons outside the central nervous system. Now, as the, those axons, so there's many, many axons in here, as they travel inward toward the spinal cord, they divide. They divide into the sensory pathway and the motor pathway. So the motor, or the, sorry, the sensory pathway is on the dorsal side, on the back side of the spinal cord. So this is the dorsal root, and this one here is the ventral root. Now, the outer covering has been taken off here on the right side of the diagram, so I'm going to look at this side. So this is the dorsal root. So this is bringing sensory information in. And remember what I said that sensory neuron looks like? Where did we say the cell body was? Kind of in the middle of the neuron, isn't it? In the middle, hanging off as an extension. So here's the first part of the sensory neuron. And then here's that, remember, there's many neurons bundled into a nerve. A neuron is a nerve cell. A nerve is a bundle of just the axon portion of a, of a nerve cell. So this is, that, this is a cluster of cell bodies here, of those sensory neurons, because we said the cell bodies in the middle of the neuron in these special sensory neurons. So this is that cluster of cell bodies there. We call this a ganglion. A ganglion is a cluster of cell bodies outside the central nervous system. This swelling that we see right here on the dorsal part of this nerve. So if we follow the dorsal root, this is all sensory information. This is all information coming in. So if you drew an arrow, you want your arrow to go in this direction via this dorsal root. So information is coming in, sensory information coming in. So we have some sensory receptor that's stimulated, fires off an action potential, and we have action potentials traveling through this nerve. And then when it gets close to the spinal cord, that sensory information divides off via the dorsal root. And where it goes is the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So it looks kind of like a butterfly. And the wings of the butterfly are divided into different horns. So that's where this neuron ends. And we'll talk about that. I have a better slide coming up. So this is the dorsal root. This is the dorsal root ganglion, a swelling that contains the cell bodies of these axons. And we only find that on the sensory portion of the spinal nerve. This portion here, this division, is the ventral portion, which is the motor. This is the response from the spinal cord. So if we're drawing an arrow, we want the arrow to go in this direction. That's the flow of information through the ventral root, is this way, out. So that's the response from the spinal cord. Now we talked about in reflexes, we have a neuron that jumps from the sensory side of my horn to the motor side. So this is where the, the neuron starts, the motor neuron starts here in the ventral horn, and then again travels this way. So when you look at a nerve out here, what type of nerve is it? Motor, sensory, or mixed? Mixed, because it hasn't divided yet. So all 31 pairs of our spinal nerves are mixed nerves. That's not the case with the cranial nerves. We only have four mixed cranial nerves. 
So if you haven't had your lab exam, you're getting a little extra review right now. Okay, so that's, that's just some basic anatomy. Now, if we look at the rest of the spinal cord, we see there's some white matter here. See all this white? These are myelinated axons within the central nervous system. And what we call myelinated axons within the central nervous system are tracts, T-R-A-C-T-S, tracts. So it's the same thing as a nerve, bundles of myelinated axons, but it's inside the central nervous system. So all this white matter, the reason it's white is because myelin is fatty. It's a lipid molecule, and it covers our axons, so we have rapid transmission and gives it that white appearance. People with multiple sclerosis have demyelination of axons within the brain and spinal cord. It has nothing to do with the nerves outside the brain and spinal cord. It's demyelination within these tracts and within the white matter of the brain. There's another condition called Guillain-Barre. That's demyelination of the nerves, of axons and the nerves outside the central nervous system. And that's caused by a virus. And it can cause paralysis and sometimes permanent damage depending on how severe it is. In some it is. Some people fully recover and some don't. So it's just one of those things. Okay, so let's look at these axons in a little bit more detail. So we have information coming in. See the cell bodies? That's what we see in the middle of this neuron here. So the blue and the green are both sensory neurons. So the information is coming into the spinal cord and it's synapsing and meeting up with the next neuron in the series. So here's the cell body of the next neuron. Notice that the dendrite in the cell body is right on the end. Like I said, only that first neuron has that funny neuron with the cell body in the middle. After that, it's a multipolar neuron with the cell body on the end like we're familiar with. So this is, the blue one is called a somatic sensory neuron. So you can kind of just put a label here, somatic sensory. And that means it's um, bringing in information from the skin and um, external structures. Skeletal muscle. The VS represents visceral sensory information. And viscera, think of organs. So if I'm having chest pain, if a woman is having menstrual cramps, if a person with a diarrhea is having cramps, meaning better hurry to the bathroom because you're going to have diarrhea, that's visceral sensory information. It's coming from the organs. And then the response is going out the ventral root. So the yellow and red are two motor neurons. And we have the visceral motor neuron and the somatic motor neuron. So we could call visceral motor neuron, we can also think of autonomic, because it's talking about smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. When, we're, when the response from the body is to go, stim remember this is going to stimulate some effector organ out here. So when the response from the body is to dilate a blood vessel, contract the bladder, contract the uterus, contract the rectum, that's all going through the visceral motor neuron, the yellow one. And notice where that is in the spinal cord, in the gray matter. It's the lateral horn of the spinal cord. And the somatic motor neuron, that's, this means it's going to voluntary skeletal muscle. So the red neuron is going to stimulate voluntary skeletal muscle. somatic motor neuron. That comes from the ventral horn. So if I have damage to the spinal cord that affects the gray matter here, this, that's going to affect transmission of information. For example, going to the bathroom to urinate, you, there is an external urethra that you have to voluntarily relax to allow urine to flow. Now you can feel the reflex, you can feel the visceral motor neuron when you get that twinge that says, oh, I have to go to the bathroom. And then as you get into the bathroom, when you really have to go and you get in the bathroom and you're in the bathroom, in the stall, you'll feel like you really have to go, right? Because that reflex is just 
uh, very strong and you have continued action potentials in the visceral motor neuron. But then when you finally sit down or stand up, depending on your gender, then you stimulate the somatic motor neuron to go. So what if a person has paralysis because of a spinal cord injury that affects the motor neurons? Can they go to the bathroom? Can they relax that sphincter and go? No. So they have to self-catheterize in order to empty their bladder because they cannot relax that external sphincter because they don't have control of it because of spinal cord injury. And that's where we get a lot of people that have spinal cord injury um, that come in with UTIs all the time because you need really clean equipment. It's a sterile area. The urethra on the bladder is sterile. And if we're not cleaning equipment properly and it's expensive to use a brand new catheter every time a person has to urinate, um, they really have to watch their fluid intake because you know some days you have to go more often than others and you don't want to become overly full of urine because that can cause problems and it's a whole other issue. Um, but so they need to have clean equipment. So um, I had a patient one time that had a spinal cord injury and he said when he went to the disposable cath where he gets, he uses a fresh sterile catheter every time he eliminated urinary tract infections. When he was reusing the equipment, he had UTIs constantly. So it's, uh, it's um, in and out. When they have to go, they insert the cath, they empty their bladder, they pull it out, they throw the cath away. Nope, nope, because when you leave it in, it's a source of infection, yeah. In nursing homes, they leave it in, and it shouldn't be the one that goes up the urethra because that just sets you up for infection. The best type of catheter for long-term use is the suprapubic catheter, which is in the pelvic, you know, goes through the skin, and there's less chance of infection that way. Because you're not going, because think of people that are, you know, um, paralyzed or whatever, and or just have incontinence of stool. Now you have stool right around that catheter. It creeps right up. It rides right along that catheter. That bacteria does and infects every time. I mean, take a look at your patients that do have the long-term catheter. Look at their urine. I mean, it's very cloudy, chunks, smells bad. They have chronic infection. Yeah, you know, you, um, UTIs are just, after the third day of a Foley, which is the indwelling catheter that stays there, chance of infection goes up 70%. I had to do a little presentation on that for nursing, nursing school, and it's terrible. That's why they want it out right away. And then you have families say, oh, you know, she had her hip replaced. Let's keep the Foley in because, you know, she's in a lot of pain and she doesn't want to have to get up to the bathroom. But, yeah, we don't want to have a UTI set in and, and keep her in the hospital and infect the new hip that we just put in. So we really want to get that out if we can. Yes? What did you say? That's okay. But the last time, what did you say is the other one called? This one here? Yeah. This is called a bipolar neuron. I think, now I'm talking myself into a corner. I think maybe it's, well, let me look. Now I have to look. It's in your textbook, the three different types of neurons. Just for reference, I'll give you the page number. It's in the first cha uh, chapter 11. Um, unipolar neuron. Uh, page 394 of your textbook. It's unipolar. Yeah, bipolar is there's two extensions off of the neuron are off of the cell body. Okay, so does everybody understand that? This is the sensory pathway information is coming in, and there's two types of information, two types of neurons. There's the somatic and the visceral. And then going out, there's the motor response. Again, somatic and visceral. Okay, so we talked about a reflex arc in lab already, so let's just quickly review that. What starts things out here? Here we, here we see that special neuron that we're talking about. So we said this is a unipolar neuron because the cell body is on just one little extension, one pole. So that's why we call it a unipolar. So this is that special neuron. Remember, this, these are all clustered in the dorsal root ganglion, these cell bodies. So what would go out here? Sensory receptor. Good. Sensory receptor. So this is the modified end that's a sensory receptor. And what do we call the whole neuron then here? Sensory neuron. 
And then if it's a reflex and it's going to jump right away to the response without going to the brain for processing, this is called a interneuron. And then this response is called a motor neuron. And then out here at the end of the axon terminals is effector organ. So that could be a skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or gland. So that's the direction in a reflex arc. Okay, so now we're going to talk about ascending and descending tracts. What did I say a tract was? Myelinated axons within the central nervous system. So they're going up and down the spinal cord, highways of information that started outside in the, in the peripheral nervous system via that sensory receptor, and then it's brought into the spinal cord, and now we're gonna take it where it needs to go. And it needs to go to the brain for processing because we need to elicit a response. So you have information coming in, do we need to respond to that? So if you look at the white matter that we looked at here, looks kind of boring, not very special. But now in this, I can see there's clusters of specialized axons that only carry certain information coming in from the outside. And these are our, motor or, um, our ascending and descending tracks. The ascending tracks are sensory tracks because they're bringing information in from the outside and taking it to the brain to decide what to do with it. So everything you see in blue here is an ascending sensory track. So that's what you want to label here, ascending sensory. Everything you see clustered in red are descending motor tracks. So information is coming down from the brain to the outside. So where are these tracks going to leave the spinal cord? So neurons from this are going to leave the spinal cord. Where are they going to synapse? Where are these axons, axon terminals? going to end. Ventral, before the ventral root, you should draw an arrow. An arrow from here to the ventral horn, then to the ventral root. So from every red spot, you want to have an arrow to the ventral horn, then to the ventral root. So this is downgoing information from the brain going to the ventral horn out the ventral root, because that's the motor pathway. So how about the ascending tracks? So that's going up to the brain, so all these blue are going up, but the information comes in through the dorsal root to the dorsal horn, and then the arrow should go this way, or this way, or this way, or this way. It's going from the dorsal horn to the appropriate tract. And what we're going to find in most of the ascending tracts, there's three neurons in series. And we're going to call them the first order neuron, the second order neuron, and the third order neuron. And it'll make sense when we look at the next diagram. So does everybody understand what the blue and the red represents and where it's going? Yes? The ascending, it, we have one neuron, the first order neuron brings things in, it's that sensory receptor, and then it synapses on the dorsal horn. And then the next neuron goes from the dorsal horn to the tract, whichever sensory tract we're talking about, depending on the stimulus, and then it goes up the spinal cord. So where's the arrow? It starts at the horn. The end of the first order neuron is here at the horn. And I think this is going to make more sense when we look at our, our tracks. So hold that question. Let's go into the tracks, and you can see what I'm talking about here. So we have to go down one to the beginning. So let's start here. A couple of different tracks. We have, and for a textbook reference, this is on page, this diagram is on page 470, and it's because the PowerPoint is kind of large, it's split into two PowerPoints, so this is the, the top, and that's the bottom. 
So we're going to start here. The first order neuron, and we're going to talk about the dorsal. So let's start here with the dorsal column. Information comes in from the foot in this case, and the information that it carries. We're going to make a little chart together here. Is fine touch pressure and conscious proprioception. So right here, I just want you to write dorsal column on the dark blue one. Yep, write dorsal column. And then we're going to create a table to summarize this information, because the more you can group information together, the easier it is. So we're going to insert a table here, and it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 wide, 3 deep. And I'm going to change my layout to landscape, my margins to narrow. All right, so the first column, what we're going to put here, is um, name of tract. And then we're going to have sensation. And sensation transmitted. So what type of information is it carrying? And then we're going to put first order neuron, and then second order neuron, and third order neuron. And then lastly, Does it cross over spinal cord? If yes, where? So the first one we're talking about is the dorsal column. There's two parts to the dorsal column. There's the fasciculus cuneatus, and there's the fasciculus gracilis. And we'll find that the fasciculus coniatus starts in the cervical portion of the spinal cord, and the fasciculus gracilis is in the lumbar region of the spinal cord, is where we find these columns begin. Okay. Cervical spinal cord, and this is lumbar spinal cord. So sensations that are detected in this tract are fine touch, pressure, and what we call conscious proprioception, which means body position. We have special receptors in our muscles and joints that tell us that we're standing up or that we're moving sideways or that we're sliding down a slide or that we're climbing upstairs that tells us where our body position is at. Now, if you've been on a roller coaster or in a spinning ride, that really confuses our joint receptors and muscle receptors, and we don't know if we're up or down or what's going on until the ride is done. So typically, though, we have a conscious awareness of what position we're in. And if you've ever had dizziness, that kind of messes with that information, doesn't it? Where you feel like the room is spinning or that you're moving you know, to the side when you're standing still. So if we go back to our diagram, is everybody okay with this? Are you still working? I'm just going to add names of the other tracks we're going to talk about. So just so you know that these are the 
ascending or sensory tracts. So the first order neuron. Are we ready? So the first order neuron. So let's look at where one neuron ends and the other one begins. This is the first, oh, we're on this side, sorry. So here's the first order neuron. It's a sensory neuron. It enters into the dorsal horn. Makes sense, right? Because that's a sensory part of our gray matter. But then it branches. It has a branch, actually, that extends upward all the way up, keep going up, to this portion of the spinal cord. This is actually, if we look at your textbook, where is this? If you're on page 470, you'll see that after it passes upward, it, it stops. The first order neuron ends at the medulla oblongata, which is in the brain stem, the first part of the brain. So that neuron ends there. And then, the, so that's the end of the second order neuron. So if we go to our chart, the first order neuron is sensory, oops, sensory receptor to dorsal horn. Everybody agree with that? And upward to medulla. So it actually branches, comes in to the dorsal horn, then branches and goes all the way up to the medulla where it ends. So that's the end of the first order neuron. And the same thing holds true for upper body neurons in this tract. Then the second order neuron starts in the medulla and it travels all the way up to what structure is this? Do you remember that from general A&P? In the brain, smack in the center, that little circle in the center of the brain. Remember your sheep brain, the little circle when you saw a side view? Starts with a T and an H. Thalamus, yep, that's the thalamus. Okay, so if we look at the second order neuron, where did it start? medulla oblongata to the thalamus. So the thalamus in the brain is kind of like a secretary. Information is coming into the office and the secretary has to decide who gets this information. Is this shipping and receiving? Is this accounts receivable? Is this bill payable? Or however you say it. Um, where does it go? That's what the thalamus does. So the thalamus is going to say, okay, this is information coming in from the face. So we're going to send this to the part of the cortex that deals with facial sensation. And there's a nice picture of the cortex, the sensory cortex. And you learned about the sensory cortex back in general A&P when you were looking at parts of the brain. You looked at the post-central gyrus and the pre-central gyrus. Do you remember looking at that when you're looking at the cerebrum? If I can find that here, I think it's in chapter 12. So it's on page 432, 434. So the post-central gyrus is a, a region of the cortex. And on page 435, it shows you the map of the post-central gyrus. And it shows you what part of the cerebrum controls what part of the body. You'll notice on page 435 that the region controlling the face is pretty big. It takes up a big part of the somatosensory cortex. So that's where we're going to process that information. And what information are we processing in the, with, with this tract? Touch, pressure, and body position. Okay. So when we talk about fine, I should uh, be dis discriminative. Which means, remember when you did the two-point touch in lab? You could tell if you were hitting it with one or two on the skin. That is using, you're stimulating the dorsal column. You're stimulating receptors that feed into the dorsal column. So if we look at the third order neuron then, that starts in the thalamus and goes to the post-central gyrus. You're looking at a frontal section here. So if you, you know how you slice a meatloaf? Picture the brain like a meatloaf and you're slicing it front to end. So this is like right kind of in the middle. And there's the somatosensory cortex, the post-central gyrus is all of this gray matter here. So third order neuron is from the thalamus to the 
sensory cortex. Now let's look. Does it cross over the spinal cord anywhere? Did, did it cross over to the other side? It did right here, didn't it? Where did it cross over? Do you remember where this is? Yes, yes, at the medulla. So yes, at medulla. It is contralateral, which means opposite side of the spinal cord. It's kind of just a fancy name. Okay. So what does that mean then? So if I have damage to my spinal cord, or if I have damage to my cortex via a stroke, I'm going to lose sensation on what side of the body? The opposite side, because it crosses over at that medulla. Okay, so that's that tract. The next tract we're going to talk about is the spinal thalamic tract. And there are two portions to that. Whoops, there's the lateral. I'm going to put the different ones here because the information they carry is different, is pain and temperature. And the ventral is crude touch and pressure. So this is, uh, it takes a little bit more to stimulate this tract. So when you're sitting down in a chair, that would be crude pressure or someone grabs your arm, that's crude pressure. So if we look at this one, get on the right page here, page 470. This is, whoops, sorry, this is the, this one here. So this is the spinal thalamic track, goes right here. Spinal thalamic, make sure you're on 12.34B. So we have information coming in. Here we can see this is pain and temperature. So here we have a match. Here we have someone cut their finger. So that's pain and temperature. And if we get enough temperature, that can cause pain, can't it? So those same sensory receptors for pain and temperature follow the same pathway, which makes sense. The good news about that is, let's say someone's having pain. What happens if we put a hot warm, I shouldn't say hot, a warm blanket on that painful area. Yeah, it lessens the pain because we're stimulating those neurons for temperature, which decreases our awareness of those pain receptors because they follow the same pathway. Same thing with ice, if I apply ice. So whenever you have a patient in pain and their medicines are not working, you can still give them the medicine and say, okay, we're going to try to get on top of your pain, but let's try this. And I had that just last weekend. I had a patient that had extreme pain in her chest from surgery and nothing was working. We tried, we hit every single thing we could possibly give her and she was still in pain and she was starting to get out of control, like upset and crying and hyperventilating. And I said, let's try some ice. Have you tried ice on this? Because she had warm everywhere, warm blankets and all that. I said, have you tried ice on this yet? She's like, no, I haven't. Let's try that. I mean, you want to try every possible thing you can do. It's not just pills. You got to use these other things. So we did the ice, calmed her right down. She said, oh my gosh, it really worked. So sometimes it's just something different that even if it didn't work before, maybe it'll work now. So we got to try to stimulate these receptors for temperature when pain pills are not doing the job. Okay, so where's the first order neuron? Sensory receptor to dorsal horn. Same thing as the first chart, first one in our chart. Then what happens though? Crosses over right away and goes all the way up to, whoops, where? Where is this again? The thalamus. And then to the same thing as the other one, somatosensory cortex. So 
have to go to our chart. First order neuron is sensory receptor to dorsal horn. And this one had a branch in it, which was a little bit unique. This one does not have a branch, so it's done. At the dorsal horn, it's done. Then the second order neuron picks up that information via the synapse between them, right? Acetylcholine being released, binding to chemically gated channels on the second order neuron, firing off an action potential, and carrying it up the spinal cord. So it's going from the dorsal horn to where? Thalamus. And then that third order neuron picks up that information and takes it from the thalamus to the Now, what you're developing is a great study tool because can you start to see relationships here? And what students do sometimes is they make flashcards out of this stuff which separates it all. And you don't see that, oh, these are the same. I don't even have to worry about that. Third order neuron is the same. Look at second order neuron. They both end in the same place. There's only a difference of where they start. That's easy to remember. So you can start to kind of categorize these things and minimize the information that you're trying to remember. And then, does it cross over? Yes, and where? Look at your PowerPoint. Where did it cross over? At the dorsal horn. Yep, at the dorsal horn. So it crossed over right away. It is contralateral. Again, it's on the opposite side. Oops. All right, the last tract we're going to talk about is the spinal cerebellar. So it's subconscious proprioception. So you have your cerebellum has a lot to do with your balance, that you don't have to think about it. It's just keeping you contracting your muscles in the right way to keep you upright. So when you're upright, you're standing upright without really having to think about it because your cerebellum is making adjustments. So if I lean a little bit to the left just because my body contracts on that side to keep me upright, I don't have to think about it. So subconscious proprioception. So again, know what the term proprioception means. Proprioception. Body position via receptors. They're called proprioceptors in the joints and muscle. Oops, proprioceptors in the joints and muscle. All right, so let's take a look at this tract. That was back with our dorsal tract. So here we go. So here's that special receptor, a proprioceptor, that we'll talk about when we get to the muscular system. So the first order neuron comes in to the dorsal horn. So you can label this one spinal cerebellar here. So the first order neuron comes in and synapses on the dorsal horn, just like all of our other ones. So we can just pretty much copy this and put it here. So sensory receptor to dorsal horn. Then it travels up the spinal cord and this you have to go back in our early, earlier notes. The first tract in your notes, there's two listed there. So we started here, though. This is where it starts on this slide, slide number 26, which is two below this one, two after this one. So if you find this one, go two down from that. We're here. Okay, so first order neuron is there. Second order neuron goes from the dorsal horn all the way up to this is a cerebellum here. It comes through the pons, so this little fat portion here is the pons, and then here's the cerebellum. So if you want to just label these two gray squares, pons, cerebellum. So then it ends at the cerebellum. So if we go to our second order neuron, it's dorsal horn, horn to cerebellum. And there is, if you notice, there is no third order neuron. Does it cross over? 
No, nope, it's all on the same side. So we say no. It is, the term for this same side is ipsilateral. These are Latin terms. Same side of spinal cord. So, with the sensory tracts, some basic summary statements we can make. With the sensory tracts, there's three neurons in series, except for the spinal cerebellar tract. There's only two neurons. With the sensory tracts, we can also say that there, it starts with the sensory receptor. The first order neuron starts with the sensory receptor and ends at the dorsal horn. Would you agree that all of them have that in common, all the tracks have that in common. So that's a summarizing statement we could make. And again, that's kind of like a test question where you're bringing it all together. S starts with a sensory receptor, first order neuron starts with a sensory receptor, ends at the dorsal horn. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the motor tracks. And the motor tracks that you have to know are on page 472, we have the pyramidal and the rubrospinal. So the pyramidal pathways, and these activate skeletal muscles. So if we go to another table, Insert table. There's going to be um, one, two, three, four. One less. And there's three. So for these, we have the pyramidal. Oops, I better make this bigger. So pyramidal, and we have the lateral and ventral motor tracts, and we almost have to keep these divided, so can I divide this into two? Split cells, number of rows. Deal. Okay, so pyramidal, we have lateral and ventral. And the type of neurons we have with the motor tract, so the name of the tract, and then, um, so we can't say sensation because this is a response, right? So we're just going to call it response. And then we have an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. So we have a total of two neurons in the descending pathways. And they're all going to end, the upper motor neuron is going to start for this one. So if we look at the pyramidal, this is on page 472 in your textbook. Let's look at the PowerPoint here. <coughs> so we're down here. This is the pyramidal. So you can label this one here. Figure 12.35 as pyramidal. So the lower motor neuron is the one that goes from the effector organ to the ventral horn of the spinal cord. So if muscle to spinal cord, ventral region of the spinal cord, that's the lower motor neuron for both of these. 
So the loader, lower motor neuron, I'm going to split this cell into two rows. So we have lower motor neuron is muscle, skeletal muscle, let's be specific, skeletal muscle to ventral horn of spinal cord. And they're both that way. And the response for both is to activate skeletal muscle, which makes sense because they both synapse on a skeletal muscle. So it's under a voluntary control. So now, remember when we studied the brain in general A&P? We had the postcentral gyrus, which we said is the somatosensory cortex, which receives sensory information in the cerebrum, the thinking part of your brain. Now, the motor cortex is the precentral gyrus. So it's that rays of tissue, the gyri that we see in the cerebrum. It's in front of the central sulcus. So that is the precentral gyrus, which we call the motor cortex. So the upper motor neuron starts in the motor cortex. And where does it end? Let's look at our PowerPoint. Let's go up one. So here's where it starts. Here's the motor cortex. It goes down. And where does it end? Where? Ventral horn. Ventral horn of the spinal cord. Good. To ventral horn. Oops, I forgot to include a row for crossing over. All right, why don't we just mention it here? Where does that motor neuron cross over? Is it the upper or lower motor neuron that crosses over? Well, they're a little different, aren't they? We have lateral and ventral. So the lateral is what's shown in pink here, and the ventral is shown in red. So where does the, if we look at, what did I say, pink? Where does the pink one cross over? The pink one, where does it cross over? Right here. This structure here is the medulla. So you want to put that in there. And which neuron is this happening at? This is the upper motor neuron, crosses over at the medulla. Crosses over at medulla. And then the ventral. Where does it cross over in the ventral? Let's look at the diagram. Comes all the way down and crosses over. What? Right, at the level of the lower motor neuron, right? So depending where the skeletal muscle is, it crosses over at, the, at that lower level of the spinal cord where the lower motor neuron is. So that's a little tricky to describe. So it goes motor cortex to the ventral horn, correct? Crosses over at spinal cord level with lower motor neuron. You can see where it's right, in, it's in the same segment of the spinal cord where the lower motor neuron is. So it comes down and crosses over right down there.
Questions on that? Upper neuron is the neuron that starts in the motor cortex and goes down to wherever we're talking. In this case, because can you see where, see where this neuron starts? So that's the dendrites receiving the impulse, cell body, bringing the information down the spinal cord, bringing it down all the way down until it ends here. That's axon terminal, that little, let's make this bigger, that little V shape is the axon terminal, and then the circle is the start of the next neuron. This is the lower motor neuron. So once that, that, down, uh, that spinal cord level to the lower motor neuron. Yep, lower motor neuron. And we're going to apply this information when we come back together on Tuesday, talking about, okay, now that we know all this stuff, make sure you bring the chart or recreate it if you don't like the way it looks because we're gonna apply some concepts to our patients, different types of injuries, different types of diseases that affect motor neurons, so you can apply this, and it'll hopefully make a little more sense, but we're not gonna have time to do that today. I wanna to just get the information down today, and then we'll go from there. But you understand upper motor neuron now? Upper motor neuron starts in this cortex and goes down to that level of the spinal cord where the nerve coming in or the nerve going out starts, which is the lower motor neuron. Okay, so now we're gonna go to the next tract, and this is called the rubrospinal tract. So this deals with muscle tone. So this is something that we don't have control over. Muscle tone is just general contraction of your muscles, just to keep you sitting, standing, just unconscious muscle tone is the sensation, or not the sensation, uh, the activity or the response. So the rubral spinal is muscle tone, unconscious or let's say inbound, I, I like unconscious better. Involuntary. So if you look at your diagram in your PowerPoint, where does it start? That area is, again, a little bit of review from general A&P. This is the midbrain. Do you remember where the midbrain is? Remember the corpora quadrigemina and the cerebral peduncles? That's the midbrain. So we're looking at the gray matter in the midbrain. So you can label this one right here so you know what that is. Label this gray one midbrain. So it's not starting, the upper motor neuron doesn't start in the cortex. So doesn't it make sense that we wouldn't be aware of this type of response from the body because it's not starting in the thinking brain. It starts in the midbrain. <clears throat> okay, so then we can see that it comes down and then it crosses over. Where does it cross over? Here's the cerebellum. It's somewhere between the midbrain and the pons is where it crosses over, because you've got cerebellum and pons here. So it crosses over right away. So it crosses over right as it exits the midbrain, it crosses over. So if we go to upper motor neuron, um, so we said the midbrain, and where does it go to? Where does it terminate? Follow it down. Here's the upper motor, where does it end? Ventral horn, right. So midbrain to ventral horn. Crosses over right away at midbrain. So it crosses over immediately to the midbrain. 
and the lower motor neuron. Same as all the others, right? Where does it start, the lower motor neuron? There's a short interneuron here. Ventral horn. Ventral horn to effector organ. Now, why is there that little interneuron? Well, what do we know about the regions of the horns? Remember when we go up to the, up here, um, actually here. <clears throat> Remember the, the lateral horn is unconscious motor response? So that's why we had that little interneuron taking it from unconscious to somatic because we want to stimulate skeletal muscle to contract, to keep us upright, to keep our muscle tone. So it's not conscious. We, it requires this little interneuron here to get us to the conscious part of our response, our motor response. <clears throat> Questions on that? <laughs> yes. Well, you know, in some, some lecture days, you guys, are going to be just information gathering days. Then we'll process it when we come back on Tuesday. I'm not going to leave you high and dry and expect you to test on this right away. <laughs> so. This, this is a gathering day, and we'll process it together on Tuesday. So be sure that you have a nice chart that's organized that you can use to get some information on. Motor descending pathways. And a, one more, a couple more things I want to mention here quick, and that is... Um, motor, looking at terminology, chart. I will pull this up so we can look at it together next week, but um, if you're trying to decide on the names, notice that spinal is the second part of the name. That's a motor pathway it, because it ends at the spinal cord and goes out. Where if you look at the ascending pathways, Two of them start with the word spinal because it starts at the spinal cord and works its way up to the brain. So that can kind of at least get you thinking so you're not memorizing five different pathways and trying to figure out which one is motor, which one is ascending. If it starts with spinal, you know it starts at the spinal cord and goes up, so it's ascending. If it ends with spinal, it's information coming down from the spinal cord or to the spinal cord and out. All right. <clears throat> 